Hello. Some of you may remember that I have started collecting an Empire Army for Warhammer inspired by the greatest port city in the old world, Marienburg. Well, it's been a minute since I started this project, and it's time for an update. I'm Jordan, this is Jordan Sorcery, and today it's my second Marienburg Diary. Way back in May, I shared my plans to create a brand new army for Warhammer Fantasy Battle. I wanted to do an army that I'd never done before, so the Empire, and I wanted it to be inspired by a really cool part of the setting that has come up in lots of different history videos that I've been researching and lots of unusual places, and just really kind of leapt out at me as just a cool part of the old world, the port city of Marienburg. This army I want it to be something special, so I want to use miniatures from pretty much every era of Citadel miniatures, from Games Workshop's past, and Marauder as well, really just to give me all of these kind of cool, characterful miniatures that each have a story. I wanted to include background and lore for all of the characters, for all of the units, and just put something on the table that I could be really proud of. It's been a long time since I've collected from scratch a brand new Warhammer Fantasy army. I've done a lot of 40k stuff and specialist game stuff over the years more recently, but Warhammer Fantasy, it's it's been a while, so this was a chance for me to get stuck in and really do something quite special. But it's an ambitious plan, and it's more ambitious, I think, because I am one of the worst modelers and painters you can possibly imagine. I'm really not very good at it. I have avoided painting as much as possible over my Games Workshop career. It's just not something that I'm very good at. It's not something that I invest a lot of time in. So taking on this really ambitious project, it's, you know, <laughs> maybe a bit of a bold choice, but I've been really excited about it. And I'm going to share where I'm up to with all of the different units that I've started assembling and collecting and some of the stuff that I've managed to get hold of and why I'm putting together things in the ways that I'm putting it together. There's still loads and loads of work to do, but we'll get started in just a moment. A little bit of housekeeping first. One, if you like this video, feel free to like this video. Two, as I am a bit worried about the painting side of things, I have reached out to a friend of mine from YouTube who's gonna give me a couple of hints and tips about how to get started with this ambitious project. And three, I've actually got some additional information about the origins of Marienburg and its creation as a city in the Warhammer setting from some comments from the original writers of Marienburg on my recent Marienburg video. So I just wanted to set the record straight and add to that development history of Marienburg that I talked about in this video right here. So Rick Priestley, who helped create the original Marienburg with the Regiments of Renown for the Bard of Gargoyles, has added a little bit of insight into where the name Marienburg came from, as well as a bit of the setting. It actually originated from Richard Halliwell. Before the creation of Warhammer, he was running role-playing games and skirmish games using Marienburg as a setting. It was inspired by a trip he'd taken to Amsterdam, and the name Marienburg was based on his then girlfriend, Marion. So it wasn't from the Teutonic Knights who had established this massive fortress in what is now Poland, like I had surmised. It is named in a very sweet way for a partner of Richard Halliwell. And the wasteland itself was actually created as a sort of post apocalyptic, post nuclear fallout zone around this city of Marienburg. And then when they created Warhammer, Marienburg as a setting from that pre. Games Workshop RPG and Skirmish game was brought over into the Warhammer world. So a very cool little bit of extra background there from Rick Priestley. And then Graham Davis, the Wolfrup writer who actually expanded on Marienburg in those original White Dwarf articles, also added that there was another huge inspiration for him and the other authors who worked on Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay that was the form of the City League from Imagine Magazine. 
Imagine was the magazine published by TSR's UK studio between 1983 and 1985, and it featured contributions from several of the Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay team who worked at TSR UK before it closed its doors and they migrated over to Games Workshop. The City League was conceived by Paul Coburn, who would later work on White Dwarf as well, and it was an incredible undertaking to create a fully functional city for Dungeons and Dragons. I should also have mentioned that Tony Ackland did the art for the original White Dwarf articles about Marienburg, and that he was an important influence on the creation of the city as well. So that's the housekeeping done, we can get on with the Marienburg diary now. So let's start with army composition. I am not approaching this in anything like a rational, logical way. I kind of like the idea of just creating armies based on the miniatures and the lore and the story that inspires me. So there's no optimization, there is no real structure to what I am building. I'm just going, okay, I like that, I like that, this is cool, that's a really great idea. I want to convert or model that miniature or paint this one or have this one in the force. So I'm not really doing this in a way that is going to make a lot of sense on the battlefield. <laughs> that's going to come later when I struggle to win any games. But one thing I do like is kind of theming up the way I'm building the army around the theme. So one thing that I think is cool is in the sixth edition of the Empire Warhammer Armies book, where they've put some extra notations about creating themed hosts of men. In the appendix for the 6th edition army book, there is a section that talks about building non-typical armies. Under the Marienburger mercenary army, it suggests that whilst being similar to traditional empire armies, you would be unlikely to see many knights in such force. As a result, it also suggests that you might see more dogs of war than usual, but fewer greatswords. An even earlier example of a Marienburg themed army is actually in White Dwarf 224 in the battle report Duke Leto's Lament. White Dwarf editor Paul Sawyer's Beastmen army, fresh from the first Tale of Four Gamer series, travelled to Australia to fight the Australian White Dwarf editor Dave Taylor's Empire army. Taylor had themed his force around Marienburg, and took the same heavy cavalry restriction that you would later see in the 6th edition Empire army book. He also limited himself to units that had no more than 4 plus armour saves and only one war machine. It turned out that Warhammer Fantasy's Duke Leto had as bad a day as his Dune counterpart, and the Marienburg army took a pretty tough defeat in this battle report. That does not bode well. For my part, I'm kind of following Dave Taylor's line here. I don't really want to include any heavy cavalry or knights. They just don't feel like they really fit the theme that well. I do think they're quite cool. I actually, when I first started collecting this Empire Army, did pick up a box of the Demigriff Knights, but although I think that they are really, really nice models and I would love to have some at some point, I think I'm probably going to leave them out of the core force. Potentially, Ponsar Trudeau will recruit some Demigriff Knights for some special missions down the line, but for now, they are not going to be in the sort of main body of La Army Trudeau. On my list of infantry, I still need to assemble a box of handgunners. I've got the Null Ironsides upgrade kit from Forge World. Together, they look absolutely amazing. I just need to assemble the whole lot. Similarly, I have got a set of the Blades of Manan, the Forge World Swordsman kit. These are beautiful models, and I'm going to be using these to represent the Vine Keepers, the loyal retainers of the family Trudeau from back home in the Grindshalp Valley. These guys are led by a really experienced captain, Renald, who is actually also the groundskeeper at the Trudeau estate when the army is not off campaigning. For Renald, I wanted an older looking soldier, someone who feels like they've seen many hard days on the battlefield and working out in the fields. The freelance mercenary from Mordheim is really close to what I want, and I'm actually not totally over the idea of using him, but I also really like the idea of going back to a classic Citadel miniature to represent an old soldier. Some of the oldest minis, in fact. The Fantasy Tribe's Fighter's Range. 
This range had some fantastic miniatures in it, and these two caught my eye. Like the freelance mercenary, they have a certain Don Quixote look that I really like for Renault. I'm actually not sure which of these two that I prefer, so neither has been chosen as the final one just yet. But I did think that as Renault is getting on, maybe he walks around a little bit hunched over, and that might explain the height difference that I'm going to be seeing with this old pre-slotter mini put next to some of the more recent miniatures that are in the rest of the unit. I'm keen for the army to include lots of different races in it to give it a real sort of mercenary kind of collective feel of all of these different factions of forces from within Marienburg coming together under the banner for the army Trudeau. So I'm going to be including dwarves and halflings and whatever else I can find that feels like it fits into the theme. But I thought it would be fun to start with the big boys first. So that's why I've assembled a unit of ogres. This pirate man-eater fellow is Glug Halfcut a vicious fighter on the battlefield, but who, when it comes to his friends, has a heart as big as his belly. He leads a mercenary unit of roguish ogres, rogers? called the Five-Sided Coin. There will be a fifth member of this unit if I can find a classic ogre that I like the look of at a reasonable price. I'm actually thinking maybe even Hrothiog, because he is very cool. The second unit that I've assembled is my one unit of greatswords. I wanted this to include some of the metal and plastic greatsword miniatures that have been released over the years, but I also wanted a couple of unique miniatures in there as well. One such unique addition was the Imelda character from Cursed City. At one point I'd considered using this model as the unit captain, but as I've mentioned before I was really inspired by the cover of White Dwarf 88. So I did decide to pick up the Alea model from 40k and to do some very minor alterations. I changed the sword to a flambeige, better known as a wavy blade, and also a head swap for one of the Stormcast Iron Souls Condemners. It's not a perfect head to match the White Dwarf cover, but I like it well enough. I also started trying to scrape the Imperial Eagle off of the cloak, but that made quite a mess, so I leaned into it and decided that this cloak is scuffed and torn on purpose, a statement of the many battles that this captain has fought through. The captain is called Amelia Latchkey, and the unit is called the Sabre Sally, the Dirty Blade. And to that end, I've also acquired this greatsword miniature, who is cleaning his gory blade. I have had to strip some of the classic miniatures that I've gotten hold of, so I decided to try using the paint blitzer that I've been hearing so much about. It's actually really, really good. I was really impressed by how well it worked, especially having tried a couple of other things before that that didn't really get most of the paint off. This managed to take off loads of the really old paint on lots of crusty old miniatures, so quite impressive. Unfortunately, due to my tomfoolery, I did have a casualty of a casualty. I was conscious of not wanting to pour a load of chemicals down the plastic pipes of the kitchen sink, so I took the pot of paint blitzer out to the outside sewer drain. I did a quick check to make sure that there was no one still in the pot, and I discovered a drunk dwarf. But I assumed that everyone else had gotten out safe. Unfortunately, as I poured the liquid down into the sewers, there was a tink as metal hit the metal grate, because I had left a Mordheim human casualty miniature inside the pot of paint blitzer and down into the Skaven Under Empire, I had poured it. That is gone forever. I was very, very embarrassed. I felt like quite a plonker, to be honest. The third and final unit that I've put together so far is a free company. This one is being led by a smuggler who typically specializes in Kislevian vodka but who has fallen out of favour with the Burgermeisters of Marienburg, and so she has had to decamp her entire operation and go on the run for a little while. For the character of Mariona List, I am using Lady Hera from Necromunda. Mariona is a follower of fashion, and she will not allow her expensive robes to be tainted by the mud of the battlefield. So she is always accompanied by three underlings, one each to support every corner of her dress. 
These models are all classics, one of which I just had to get because he is called Vintner, as in somebody who works at a vineyard. He probably would have fit well in the Vinekeepers unit, but I really liked him for this robe carrying duty. The rest of List's list is comprised of Mordheim Marienburgers, Glorio van Alten from Cursed City, and a sea elf in the form of a Black Ark Fleetmaster model. Mariona List is also accompanied by her extremely loyal and terribly exotic pet, Gref the Griffhound, a creature that few indeed have seen on the shores of the Old World. I've also put together Octran Glimscry from Curse City as well, to use as my dodgy wizard Bertrand von Mickelstein, who summons the Barda Gargoyles, but I'm not entirely sure if I want to stick with him. I'd originally intended to use Torgullis from Curse City because he is even shadier looking, and I thought that maybe I could replace some of the familiars on his base with gargoyles from the Curse City box. This is something I might still do, in fact, but for now we've got Octran. I've also dug out an Empire General, just a pretty basic one, which I will be using for now to represent Ponsard Trudeau, but I'm looking for a better miniature that I think has the feel of Ponsard. So that's definitely just a temporary use. So as you can see, I have assembled a fair few miniatures now and I have primed and xenophiled my ogres, but that is it. I have yet to take a brush in my trembling hand, dip it in paint and apply that to any miniatures. And that is because I'm a bit nervous about it. I'm, I'm scared about doing something wrong or not being able to correct it or just going down a route that I regret because I really care about doing this right. I've not done a project for me as complex and ambitious as this in years and years. This is a real departure for me, wanting to actually create something that looks good on the battlefield. Normally I just leave miniatures unpainted because of this fear of just doing them wrong. So I really wanna get this right, but I don't wanna be paralyzed by that fear. So I have reached out to an expert painter and modeler, Stu from the Miniatures Realms channel here on YouTube, to see if he can help me get started. So these units sort of are in my head. There's a unit of great swords, there's a unit of um, hand gunners and, and swordsmen and these different pieces. What I cannot imagine, and, and I guess this is probably the, the key thing in making the whole thing feel more cohesive, I've got literally no idea what they look like from a sort of painting perspective? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, are they all in the same uniform? Are they all using the same colors? Are they all, because I, I mean, traditionally, I tend to paint with as few paints as possible to make it mm -hmm. as quick a job as I can. So I will literally just do a Zenithal highlight and then a, a couple of like, maybe a few pops of color here and there. Sometimes I will use different colors just from a spray can to try and, you know, create a bit of contrast. But then I'm quite happy with that, almost like plain pieces rather than painted miniatures as such. But it feels like that's not going to work for this army because I want this to be something really special. So, yeah, I don't know if my out, my ambition has outstripped my capability by quite a lot on this one. So <laughs> I don't know where to really start. No, but you, you can always learn. Mm. And if this is going to be the project of the your you know this period of your gaming life, the really big thing for you, yeah. In, the enthusiasm will, will probably carry you through it. Hmm. Um, especially as there are lots of different kinds of units. If it was, um, I want to build a Marienburg force with 120 halberdiers, <laughs> all using the, uh, the, the, the advanced hero quest um, Empire halberdier, you'd probably um, lose the will to live by the end of it. But you, you've got lots of different cool miniatures from based on the previous video you did. So I think that will help. What that the challenge that will bring you then is is do you want to go down a single kind of army scheme all the way through, or because these units have come from different areas, do you want them to have their own individual personalities? And that'll be one of the first choices you have to make. So the simpler option will be to make it fairly uniform. But does that fit your theme? And that will be your narrative sort of bashing up against simplicity and the overall aesthetic because when you look at the army if it's um too mismatched sometimes it can look a little bit um a little bit messy but there are ways to do both um, right the first way to do both would be have them dressed in their own garb um and maybe paint a champion or your standard or a musician or something in the marienburg colors with your yellow red and blue isn't it that's the core colors of marienburg. That, yeah that sounds right yeah 
So if you look into history, if you look back to sort of liveries, livery coats, so you're thinking Wars of the Roses, um, and sort of late medieval times. Um, a lot of a lot of units would just be mercenary men, um, and they wouldn't. Yeah, great book, great, absolutely fantastic. But so you, it, so if you've got those um, historically, they wouldn't all be wearing the right livery coat, even though they might be on a painting today. They wouldn't have that kind of money to to put them in that kind of different color costume because they're fighting for this lord or baron or whatever it is that day. Mm -hmm. But a couple of the guys may well do the, the sergeant or the the person in charge may well have the, the the that that sort of leader's livery. So you could do it that way. So you could kind of yeah, your rogue is looking one color, and then the guy that's looking the poshest, who's the uh, he, he gets to wear the, the the red, yellow, and and blue, and the others you paint however you wanted to goes along with their own little narrative story that you build up for them. Which also helps you break down the painting because you can say yeah. I'm going to focus on this unit and that unit. I mean, that's um, a fun idea because I, I I do like what what you're saying there is it it does bring character a narrative to it like you say because you instantly are saying well this guy's the one in charge or you know there's a, there's a certain <laughs> something to this particular character. Other ways to bring it in is your your basing anyway. Basing tends to uniform an army no matter what you do. Um, so even just basing a, a standard kind of flock and paint the same rims on all your bases will kind of tie it all in together. But if you're going to go with an army that's quite wide ranging and it's miniature tight, especially with scale as well, you might want to go for something quite striking with the basing that almost. Well, I've got some ideas on the basing. Out. Yeah. I mean, so what, so what's your idea with your, with your basing? You can say sort of wooden sort of dockyard or something. Yeah, like exactly that. that. Exactly that. So I've already done like a test. I don't think it will show up very well on. on yes. Camera. I think I've seen that. That's probably why I had, see the movies on your instagram yeah like so i i like this idea i i'm not sure about the final so i actually got a load of this particular tile it's like 3d printed base uh that i just bought online it's cool my only fear with these is that there's a lot of like bits on the bases so there'll be like loose planks there'll be uh, bits of rope and stuff like that so it might make it difficult to actually put stuff on there but i like the idea of doing a consistent, Too much about that. cool mm. base yeah, yeah, I th that would be really striking. And then because that's so eye-catching and that will all be pretty much one colour with maybe some variations for oil spills and things like that, it'll also be really, really quick for you to paint. Hmm. I think that that will also, if you decide not to have one standard colour throughout the army, that will just tie it all in in such a strong way, much more than just a standard kind of earth and grass tufts theme would because that's, yeah, that, that's such a strong image, hmm. that, that those planks, I think that, I would definitely stick with that kind of idea if I was yeah. you. Okay. Well, what what do you think is the the minimum number of colours <laughs> that I oh, could the... use when um, painting? Because I, I did. So I, I the the only things I've painted so far for the army are like a cannon mm -hmm. and uh, the hellblaster, and I've basically done these with like three colours. You can't again. You can't really tell that well, but I basically dry brushed the whole thing with a couple of different colors with the brown and then with the metal and i put a bit of gold on for some of the the accents i think that looks perfectly serviceable for my purposes it was it's, it's not gonna win any awards <laughs> at all um but i'm not sure i can get away with that sort of level of simplicity with all of the different units it's it depends on the miss not even the the individual sculpts are the problem sometimes because there will be bits you just need to paint. So it's quite hard to say. Mm. There's no such thing as a kind of a limited matter of colors. It's whatever looks right, to be honest with you. So if you want to pick one color as your main army theme, you probably want a secondary color to, to offset it slightly. Um, pick something you're comfortable painting with. Though. So if you um, say you really really like painting red and find it easy this is an example don't use red because it's red and well red and purple kind of work but uh, if you um find something you're not going to want to pull your hair out while painting because mm. if you're going to do this a lot so um so what was you, you know you you're looking at the sort of deadly nightshade sort of color what would you what what, what color can you see that up against what would you <sighs> I, do, I mean, I mean do you want to completely get rid of the idea of using the the, the old standard colours for Marienburg, and you're saying, well, well, they're there, but it's they're not a Marienburg force; they just happen to be based there, and this is a different. Person. Yeah, I mean, that's narratively right. that's the case for sure. Really? I think there would that, be that works, a unit or two from Marienburg 
itself mm-hmm. who wear the colors of Marienburg. I think then a lot of the mercenary units could easily just be whatever they turned up to right. work in that day. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so yeah, and and may, maybe probably only got the one set of clothes as well. Yeah, so absolutely. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I guess there's going to be a certain like I would imagine it gets very confusing on the battlefield. So everybody having. Uh, you know, whether it's a neckerchief or a headband or a, a cummerbund or whatever it is of the same color might help people who don't know each other because they're all mercenaries true, recognize true. each other on the battlefield. So maybe there's something in that. So thank you so much to Stu. I actually feel a lot better about starting this project properly now. I have ordered some paint. I've got the coat de arms, deadly nightshade. I really want to bring together that theme. I'm going to use that as I think the unifying color. I know it's quite dark, which isn't really the sort of marienburg flavor so i'm gonna need pops of color somewhere else but i think i'm (laughs) almost ready to actually start painting some stuff up which is what i'm going to be doing for the next diary entry i'm also going to assemble those iron sides and assemble those swordsmen i'm going to be leaving the land ship for now because i am still nowhere near ready for that particular challenge but yeah i want to get some stuff painted and i want to share that with you in the next diary entry. Oh, and I've got a few neat surprises that I'm working on as well to include in the army with a little bit more character. And you may also wanna keep an eye out on the channel because I'm soon gonna be releasing an audiobook version of the first part of the Widow Trudeau. This is the fiction that I'm writing to accompany this army. Whilst Ponsard and the games that I play will tell his story, this is the story of Anna Trudeau, the family and the wife that Ponsard has left behind on the Trudeau estate. I'm gonna be releasing part two of that in written form on my website soon, and you can actually read part one on the website. There's a link in the description below, but if you would rather listen to me tell that story, that will be on the channel soon. I want to say a big thank you to Stu from the Miniatures Realms channel for helping me with my questions and concerns about starting this big painting project. I've included a link in the description below to the Miniatures Realms channel. There are loads of really good tutorials about loads of different Warhammer and 40k and other miniatures ranges. Really, really fascinating and interesting and inspiring stuff. And if you want to see me and Stu talking about lots more stuff, then you should know that I've just launched Jordan Sorcery's GW Books Club. Every single month, Stu and I will be discussing one of the original 17 GW books. This is the imprint that predates Black Library from between 1989 and 1991 that published 17 novels and short story anthologies set in the worlds of Warhammer Fantasy, Warhammer 40,000, and Dark Future. Those novels are all really interesting and examples of just a different era of Games Workshop's games and worlds. So we're going to be going through them, talking about the context, talking about our thoughts and theories and reflections, and really just having a great time reading one book a month. My Patreons will also get an exclusive opportunity each month to talk with me live about the books. So for August, we're going to be meeting on August 20th, and we're going to be talking about ignorant armies. And then on August 27th, The video on the YouTube channel, the book club discussion between me and Stu, will be released for everybody to check out. So if you want to join in, all you need to do is get hold of a copy of Ignorant Armies. It's going to have to be secondhand, unfortunately, because it's now out of print. You might be able to get it from a library or on eBay, or if you prefer to listen to it in audiobook form, you could check out the Old Hammer Fiction Podcast, where the recordings are really, really high quality, and all of the short stories from Ignorant Armies have been released. They're just not in the same order as the book. It's going to be really fun. I am really looking forward to talking with my Patreons. I'm really looking forward to talking with Stu. I think this is going to be a great time. Well, that is a lot of stuff, isn't it? (laughs) Hopefully you've enjoyed this Marienburg diary. I'm really enjoying putting together this Marienburg force. It has been so much fun. I'm just about ready to start painting it, so we'll see the outcomes of that as well as whatever else I'm able to assemble over the next month or so. I hope that you enjoy it and that you come back and want to find out more about my Marienburg exploits. Until then, thank you very much for watching. I'm Jordan, and this is Jordan Sorcery.
this is going to be the very last thing we do. It is awesome. It looks amazing. <laughs> but I'm very worried about this.